stated uh, the main theorem with a corollary. So I thought I should restate that. Um, so let me uh, do that first. And I, I neglected uh, to say last time that it is a, uh, uh, this result is a joint uh, theorem with uh, Louis Lomeli. Okay, so the, the theorem is uh, given a bunch of data, then you can find some cuspidal representation with some property. Okay. So the uh, the data that is given includes a uh, a global field um, K. Okay, but well, so I, I'm going to assume a positive characteristic. Okay, so is the function field of a of an absolutely irreducible smooth projective curve over a finite field. Here, uh, y is a uh, is a curve over uh, a finite field, okay. and um, I'm given uh, S not non-empty uh, finite set of places of uh, K, uh, which is the same as a uh, Saying that it is a uh, uh, finite set in the, on, the, in, on the set of uh, closed points of the curve Y. And uh, I'm given a connected reductive group H over K. Let me denote it's uh, the center will be uh, ZH and then the identity component of the center will be Z. So it is a torus. Um, I have N in H. Um, a smooth connected K split unipotent subgroup. So at the end of last time, I, uh, I guess I give some examples to illustrate, you know, that if you don't put this condition, especially K-split, you can have some rather nasty uh, unipotent subgroups. And I want to avoid those. Um, okay, so you have that. Um, then, um, in addition, you have chi. Um, so this is a, Automorphic character of okay, unitary character. Uh, of course, this is not a group, but uh, you have omega. It's uh, it's basically a central character, so an automorphic central character. Assume it is uh, unitary. So you see, so far all the data are global, right? You have some global field with some groups, algebraic groups defined over that global field K. You have a bunch of automorphic characters. Okay. And so here now you have the local uh, data, which is for all V, for all places V in the finite set S naught, I'm given a, uh, a pi V, which is a, a irreducible supercuspical. Uh, representation of H V. And um, such that basically it has central character omega V. But uh, let me write it this way. And I'll call, so, so this condition is, is just uh, uh, instead of 
having to write it down each time, I will say that this, this is saying that pi v is chi v distinguished. So that's the data that is given. And then uh, the conclusion is that there exists a hospital automorphic representation chi of uh, H A uh, satisfying a, a bunch of conditions. Um, so firstly, this pi globalizes the given uh, supercuspicer. For all v uh, not in S naught, uh, I want to say that uh, let me let me say that a uh, pi v is uh, is contained in the principal series. Okay, so it's uh, contained in uh, some induced representation. Tau v with uh, e not v uh, minimal. Uh, parabolic um, over a b. <coughs> and in fact, um, I mean, more or less, you can say this guy is uh, is has depth zero. Okay, it has very low uh, ramification. But let me not uh, no, not emphasize that here. I mean, it's important for me to be like that. And finally. Uh, what has this got to do with chi? Well, um, and omega, well, it has central character omega, okay, meaning character under V. And uh, lastly, um, chi is uh, so called globally and chi distinguished. Which means that um, the the map, if you take a, a function in pi and you um, write down this integral, this integral, so this is a linear functional on pi, right? And in fact, it defines an element in this the global analog of this home space, okay, where you suppress the V and you replace, uh, you consider adelic groups. It, it is a certain explicitly constructed element in that home space, and we want, want this to be non-zero. Okay, so as I said, uh, for the, so today what I want to do uh, for the first hour is to uh, discuss the proof of this in some detail. Okay. Now, uh, so, uh, so for the purpose of the of the proof, of course, I'm going to let, just make life easier by I'm assuming going to assume my group H is is split semi simple. Okay. Then of course, uh, th for every v, H v is split as well. So this uh, v zero v is just a Borel subgroup. Okay. Um, and I'm going to also simplify my life. Um, here, so I, I assume n is any um, you know unipotent subgroup, right? But I'm going to uh, simplify my life by considering sort of only two cases. One is n is trivial, so that's the trivial group is uh, an example, right? And the other uh, example I'll keep in mind is when n is the unipotent radical of the Borel subgroup. Okay? In that case, um, I'm especially uh, interested in the case when the uh, character chi is a so-called uh, character in general position or a generic character. Okay? In that case, the condition here is, is saying that the supercuspital are so-called generic supercuspital, and this linear functional is the so-called Whittaker Fourier coefficient. Okay, so these are okay. So, uh, but before going to the proof, let me just say the um, so the, the proof. Uh, basically relies on uh, uh, so uh, the following uh, sort of baby observation. Okay. Uh, so 
somehow a trivial, a trivial observation. Uh, so let me um, describe this. So suppose you have uh, um, the observation is, is the following. Suppose you have a uh, you have a number. Uh, suppose you have an alpha, okay, an integer, okay, and for some reason, uh, you know, it is in an interval like that. Let's say, okay. So how to show? Uh, so two ways to show that alpha is uh, zero. Okay, of course, there might be more than two ways, but here is uh, here are two ways. Okay, one is to show that uh, show that alpha is divisible by p to the uh, n for n uh, a very very big. Okay, so if you could uh, do that, uh, so for example, if this p to the n is bigger than capital N, you know, then uh, the only possibility is alpha equals to zero. But but here's another way. Show that alpha is divisible by uh, sufficiently many prime uh, p's. Okay, if you can show that. Uh, this integer, which we already know lies in some uh, fixed interval, okay, is divisible by too many primes, then it has better be zero. Okay. Anyhow, uh, okay, of course, this is a, a, a simple observation, but you will see as I describe the proof, you may you may try to see where this observation is used. Now, um, let's go into the proof of the, uh, of the theorem. Okay, so a uh, uh, so proof of the theorem. Um, as I said, I'm going to assume that uh, H, so I'm going to put some simplifying uh, assumption, so it's P, can be simple, and uh, let's say I have a Borel. K subgroup, and uh, I'm I'm going to assume that n is uh, either uh, trivial, okay, or uh, a unipotent radical. Of B, okay, just uh, just take this keep these two cases in mind. Uh, in fact, for the uh, Applications that I will speak about um, from next time on, these two cases suffice. All right. So since uh, uh, H is a bit semi-simple, I can fix a uh, an embedding. Um, let's call it iota from H close embedding to some S L uh, <coughs> N. Okay. Because of course, it's containing G L N. Okay. So in fact, you can even simplify your life further by just taking H to be SLN. So I think that's fine. Okay, so let's, we can pretend this is an isomorphism. Okay, so in, other, in, in, in any case, so, so, and I'm thinking of GLN as really N by N matrices. Okay, so they are uh, N square coordinate functions. Okay, so from here, we are going to get uh, coordinate functions X I J on H, and of course any point on H is determined by the value that this n square functions take. Right? If you give me a point on H, and um, if I know all the coordinates, then I know what H, what that point is. Okay. All right. Now, um, so. I want to take this embedding in such a way, so without loss of generality, I may assume uh, the following uh, compatibility. Okay, so, so first, let me assume that I, I can put this H inside so that B intersect. So that this Borel subgroup is uh, nothing but um, 
uh, edge intersect the upper triangular uh, Borel of GLN. Okay, why not? Okay. We can assume that, uh, so maybe this I call it P times U. Okay, so, and uh, you can assume P is just H intersect the diagonal matrices. Right? You can assume, uh, you know, U is H intersect upper triangular unipotent. You can assume that uh, uh, H intersect lower triangular unipotent is, is the opposite. Uh, it's an opposite or unipotent radical. Okay, so this is, you can do that. So in fact, as as I said, if you just take H to be SLN, then you don't even need this. Uh, you know, uh, to mention this. Okay, and uh, of course I can assume that this N is contained in U, right? Because N is some uh, unipotent subgroup. Um, K split, and uh, you can conjugate it so that it leaves inside this uh, specific maximal unipotent subgroup, U. Okay. That doesn't destroy those conditions over there. Okay. So you can assume that. So as I said, I'm going to uh, consider only these two cases. Okay, so this is the case when it is just U. Okay, so these are all um, okay. That part. <laughs> All right. So now um, we have a non-empty set S zero, right? In the in the in the theorem. So um, okay. So so if we let O S zero be the ring of a S zero integer. In K, so these are this means all the functions on Y, uh, which are regular at uh, uh, outside this uh, set. Okay, then um, of course we, we, we from this we are going to get a O S not uh, integral structure on uh, G L N and hence. All right, but uh, not sure why I say that, but so, so now let S be a large. Yeah, so I think that the reason I want to say that was just, uh, okay, so I'm just saying that, you know, um, you have GLN, it has the N entry, so you can N square entries. You, you just give it the naive uh, OS not integral structure. Okay. And which then induces some integral structure on uh, H. So, uh, but you see, but if you then think of H as a group scheme over spec of OS naught, of course it could have bad reduction at many places, okay? But, but that set of bad reduction is, is, or anything bad that could happen uh, would be concentrated in some finite set. So if you l throw away some big finite set of places, everything will be nice, smooth, and ramified outside that finite set. And that's what I want to say here. Be a large finite set of places such that, well, so firstly, I assume I mean, it is different from not, and for all V, uh, you know, everything is uh, nice and smooth, so H uh, um, is a, a smooth uh, reductive over OV. Okay, in other words, uh, if you look at H O V, which is nothing but uh, H K intersect G L N O V, okay, uh, it is a is a so-called hyperspecial uh, maximal compact subgroup. Okay. So you know, outside some finite set, you will be okay. Now, but I want to uh, assume uh, more. So I want to also say that uh, um, if I look at, I'm going to define something called IV plus, and what is this? This is the intersection of H, KV with 
E, upper triangular, Ewa Hori, subgroup of GLN. Okay. Then this intersection is uh, an Ewa Hori subgroup. of H K B. Okay, as I said, I mean, if you just take H to be S L N, then this is okay. But in general, uh, the point is that if, if this guy is a, a hyper special, and if you look at the reduction mod pi V, okay, pi V being a uniformizer, V, uh, then how do you uh, capture the uh, Uohori subgroup? Well, your subgroup will be the pre-image of the Borel subgroup over the residual field. Okay, so outside of some finite set, uh, you can uh, you will have this is smooth. Moreover, this uh, this embedding will be a, a close embedding of uh, a smooth group scheme. So when you reduce uh, mod pi v, you are going to get uh, an embedding over uh, of re reductive groups over this finite residual field. You take a Borel that intersect. Similarly, this Borel will intersect. Um, so all these statements behave well with respect to reduction mod pi v outside some finite set. So you can you can arrange this and and also um, similarly the i v minus which is intersect the lower triangular same thing. I want the same thing. I just have one more condition, which is that I want this n uh, to be smooth over uh, OV uh, and pi V to be trivial on n. Okay, as you as before, the smoothness will hold outside some finite set, and this is because chi is a is a smooth character. a smooth character, so it's trivial on some uh, open compact subgroup of NA. An open compact subgroup of NA almost everywhere will be, will be this thing. All right. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, if you are willing to take H to be SLN, then I don't think I'm saying anything at all here. Okay. okay. Now I'm going to fix uh, uh, two finite sets of places. Uh, which are disjoint, okay? And uh, this uh, disjoint from so so this S1, S2 are the so called good places where I have those properties. Now I'm going to describe uh, the construction of a of a, of a compact of an open compact subset of uh, H A. Okay, because uh, I think I mentioned last time the way I'm going to construct this globalization is by Poincaré series. Okay, so Poincaré series I have to take a function on H A which is smooth and of uh, compact support. Now, uh, the reason why I'm trying to construct an open compact subset is, roughly speaking, I want to take a characteristic function of this open compact subset later on. Okay. Okay. So what is uh, so I'm suppose I'm given I'm given uh, C S zero um, and a, a fixed uh, uh, open compact. 
subset of uh, H um, B. Okay. Suppose I am given this. Now I want to define an open compact subset for all other B and then put them, put them together. So I have to tell you, uh, so I, I, I want to define or construct uh, CV for all V not in S0. Did I do it over here? Okay, so let's see, let me start with the uh, easiest one. Okay, so for all B not in P, which is S union S0, union S1, union S2, because I have fixed all these uh, terms here, right? I'm going to take CV to be to be this uh, hyperspecial maximum. I already know in S0, so I have three sets uh, to tell you. For all V in S1, uh, I'm going to, actually let's do S2 first. Okay. S2, let's take CV to be IV minus. Ah, so maybe I didn't say uh, what the evo hori subgroup is of GLN, right? So it is those uh, matrices which are, so these are, uh, so they are matrices G which are congruent to So that's, that's what the uh, upper triangular evo hori subgroup of GLN consists of n by n matrices in GLN OV with integer entry, such that when you reduce modulo the uh, uniformizer, you get an upper triangular matrix. Um, okay, and similarly for the lower triangular, it will be the lower. Now for all V in S1, I'm going to let, I'm going to call it a JV plus. This is the bro P C law or bro P uh, C law of I V plus. Okay, so what, does that, what is that? Well, um, so I already told you this is I V plus, right? All the N by N indigenous matrices whose reduction mod pi V is uh, upper triangular. Okay, now, uh, of course, this is a Borel subgroup of GLN over the finite field. And we can look at its uh, unipotent radicals, which are all things like that. Okay. This is a P group. Okay. And when I take the pre image of this uh, in here, uh, that will be this pro P uh, C law. In other words, the maximum uh, pro P, normal pro P subgroup. say a couple more words. So uh, I guess, so if you look at GLN OV, of course you have the reduction mod, you know, mod, mod V and you, you get some uh, finite field. So I, and it is a reduction mod uh, pi. Right? And over here you have this uh, Borel subgroup, which is this uh, upper <coughs> triangular matrices over the finite field. The pre-image is a uh, will be this IV plus in the context of GLN, okay? But now, if I take this uh, U of FQV, which is uh, this uh, unipotent uh, matrices, okay? This is a P group. And when I take the pre-image, uh, um, this is what it is, group, okay? The reason is because when you take uh, this mod this, of course, it's just the same as this mod that, and you're just, the quotient is going to be just the torus, which is a prime to P, okay? The order is prime to P. So, so that this is the largest P subgroup of uh, this 
you will always subgroup. And it is a normal subgroup. Okay, so. Um, okay, and finally, for all other V, so for V in S, I'm going to let CV be a, to be any Iwahori subgroup, such that the character chi V on CV is trivial. Now, why is that uh, possible? Why does such a unipotent subgroup exist? Well, okay. As I said, we are looking at two special cases, right? If n were trivial, there would be no condition here because it's automatic, okay? If n were the, were the uh, unipotent radical of uh, the Borel, okay? Then, um, you see, so of course, we also have this uh, standard Iwohori subgroup here. And your character may not be trivial on it. But what happens is you can conjugate this by a diagonal element, okay? And uh, when you conjugate it, by an element like this, okay, let's say GL3, right? You take a torus element, you conjugate this, then, then what happens to the entry? Well, the, the entries up here will, will, will get multiplied by something like this. Right? Now, you can choose the A1, A2, A3 so that these numbers are the absolute value is uh, as small as you like, okay? This is going to contract this uh, upper triangular part uh, into a smaller and smaller neighborhood of the identity, okay? So um, if you make it small enough, you can ensure the character is uh, trivial. But of course, uh, this is just a conjugate of an Iwohori subgroup. It's just another Iwohori subgroup, okay? So you can always uh, arrange. Okay, so now I have defined for every V an open, compact subset. Okay, and uh, at S naught, it is just any given one. Okay? But at all other Vs, uh, you know, it, it, actually I've taken some uh, open, compact subgroup. Okay, and here is uh, the key lemma. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes, that's right. That's what I mean. So, uh, n intersect C. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this intersection, I just want to uh, say that I can uh, make this intersection very, very small. Yeah. As long as it's sufficiently small, the character will be trivial on it because it's a smooth character. So here, here's the lemma. Uh, the lemma is if uh, S1 and S2 are sufficiently large, then HK intersect uh, C. Okay, so C is this, uh, this uh, open complex subset I've constructed. Um, contained in NK. For one uh, second, okay. Yeah, that's good. Copy that, okay. So just to record that, I, I'm, I'm assuming that N is either trivial or U, okay. And, uh, If n is trivial, I need to take both of these sufficiently large. But if n is u, I, I think I can just suppress this one. But uh, uh, as you see, the proof is not hard, okay? Now, of course, we know this is a finite set to begin with. Because this is a discrete, this is compact. So what is the, the um, 
the proof. So you take, uh, let's take any element gamma in this intersection. Okay, remember gamma is an n by n matrix. Okay? And so it has n square entries. Right? And those entries, this coordinate function, right? which is a function phi of y, of a curve y. Okay? So this x, i, j, gamma are functions on y. So, um, let me see what we are doing here. Okay, so I want to examine the behavior of these functions, okay, at each close point of y, okay, or each place of y. Okay, now, so let's see, for all v, not in T, remember T is this S union S not union S1, union S2. Um, you see all this, uh, if gamma were in this intersection, right? So this uh, um, product of V not in T, C, V is just product V not in T of H of O, V. Okay? So this implies that for all ij, xij of gamma, uh, I in I O V, okay. I E, it has no poles at V in a close point in V not in T. So we have this n square uh, rational function on a curve, and we know that outside of this finite set T, it, it is uh, regular, okay. There's no pole. Now, if you are in here, okay, so you see at S0, you're just given, you, you, you had a fixed open compact, okay? Now, uh, so this means that the V addict valuation of each of these is, you know, is going to be bounded. Okay? So there's some bounded order of pole. Okay? So there is uh, some uh, M, okay, such that, uh, all such that for all i j and for all v, the order of poles of x i j gamma uh, is less than m. Uh, this, this is for all gamma in that uh, in, in in that finite set of uh, if and so forth. What about V in a, I mean, let's say, as a time? Well, um, for V in S1, this CV is uh, by construction KV plus, right? So this means that if uh, gamma is in here, then for all, so in the upper triangular part, sorry, on the lower triangular part, so this means uh, i is bigger than j, um, xij gamma is congruent to zero mod this. Right? In other words, x i j gamma vanishes at all v in S1. Okay? Which, which is a well, that's a fixed point. And for all i, x 
i i gamma minus one vanishes at all v in S one. Likewise, at the places. In S2, CV is IV minus, so this implies that, uh, just like before, but now it is for the upper triangular part, uh, XIJ gamma vanishes at all V in S2. Okay, now, now you see, if you make um, S1, uh, sufficiently large, then you, you see that these entries for i bigger than j, which are the upper, sorry, lower triangular entries, um, they will have, uh, they will vanish to, you know, they will have at least the cardinality of S1, number of zeros, okay? So if you make this S1 very, very big, in the end, you're going to have more zeros than poles, right? Because uh, you know that outside of this, finite set, there's no pole. The only poles, you know, are possibly in S, at, at these places, and, and, and each one of them, there's, is some, there's some uh, finite order, some upper bound, okay, which depends on the uh, compact subset you, cho you have already chosen at those places, okay? So now when you increase this S1, you know, when S1 is sufficiently large, this will have more zeros than poles, and that's not possible, right, because, uh, um, principal divisors should have the same number of zeros and as, uh, as their poles. I mean, uh, rational functions should have same number of zeros as poles, or put it another way, by the product formula. Okay. So, uh, when S1 is, uh, the size of S1 is sufficiently large, uh, you see that this thing has to be just a zero function, okay? It has to be a zero for all i bigger than j, and x i i of gamma is just a constant function one for all i. So if if your group n is uh, is just a unipotent radical of Borel, uh, then then you are already done, right? You don't need this S two at all, okay? Because so. Uh, this implies that this intersect C is contained in U K. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you let S2 also be sufficiently large, then, uh, then you, you get the constraints on the upper triangular part, so this thing will be zero for all I less than J. Okay, and this together uh, taken together will tell you that HK intersect C is just one point. Okay? So you, so you see that uh, if you think back to that uh, trivial uh, observation at the beginning where um, I said there were two ways of showing that an integer in some bounded interval is zero, right? And clearly, I'm using the second way, which is to show that that integer is divisible by sufficiently many primes, okay? Whereas, um, in my last lecture, when I talk about showing that a Poincare series is non-zero, I use this stringing support uh, argument at one place, okay? And that is using that first observation, showing that it is divisible by sufficiently many powers of a given prime. All right, so depending on which case you are in, I mean, if you are, if n is u, you don't need h2, you already get the lemma. If, if n is trivial, you, you use s1 and s2 and you get this. Okay. So now I can, uh, I can uh, construct a, a test function f uh, from which I'm going to build a Poincare series. Okay. Uh, any question? So construction of uh, a test function F. 
Okay. Now, uh, for all v not in S not, I have a super capacitor, right? So I'm going to let uh, F v not be a matrix coefficient of pi v not. Right? In theorem, I have a given super capacitor uh, such that. So I think I mentioned also last time one equivalent way of saying a supercapacitor is that the matrix coefficient is uh, compactly supported, modulo center. Okay. But I'm assuming the group is semi-simple, so the center is not a uh, issue. Okay. So I I would like now why why does this exist? Well. Um, this is because we are assuming that, um, so re remember that in the theorem, we are assuming that this, uh, pi v naught is chi distinguished, right? We know this is not zero. Um, I.e., we are assuming that the twisted Jacquet module, um, let's say this, so this is, The Jockey module is not uh, zero. So what, what, what is this space? This space is pi v naught modulo uh, the span of uh, vectors uh, at, okay. So it's the maximum quotient on which n acts by this character. I'm trying to explain why you can find a matrix coefficient with this property. Okay, so in any case, uh, so this means that because this space is not zero, and this is just this quotient, right? So this means that there exists uh, a vector um, f, okay, in pi v naught, uh, such that f. Uh, is not in the kernel of the projection map uh, from here to but one has the alternative description of this kernel okay so this kernel are all those uh, I'm running out of uh, I don't want to use V so so let me just say W in pi V naught such that integral Uh, is zero. Okay, so where is this <coughs> integral happening? Well, I want to I want to write n, but but the integral may not converge. So let me just write um, for some uh, uh, sufficiently large uh, open compact, uh, let's say subset omega. So there's this, uh, um, so of course we, we know what the kernel of this projection is. They are all vectors that look like that. But there's an alternative characterization uh, given in this way. Okay, so, but we have a f which is not in the kernel. So this means that we have a f such that this integral is uh, not zero for all sufficiently large uh, omega. Then, um, okay, so for all uh, sort of omega, let's say, for all sufficiently large omega, um, this is not zero. Now, whatever this is, right? This is just another element inside inside this uh, inside the, the, the representation. So this, so, so there exists F check in the dual representation uh, such that the pairing between this and this non-zero vector is not zero. Okay. 
So um, if you bring this, this pairing inside, what you have will be a, a matrix coefficient. So meaning, So, so I, I, I will have this. Okay. Now, of course, if I'm in the case where n is trivial, then there's nothing to assume here. Okay. And let me assume uh, that. Uh, no, sorry. So if n is trivial, then uh, all I'm assuming here is that f v zero doesn't vanish at one. That, that's all. Now, now that I have chosen this matrix coefficient, which is a compactly supported function on H, so I'm going to set C uh, V0 to be the support of F V0. Okay, for, this is for V0 in S0. Okay, so that defines a uh, compact subset at the places in S0. And by the earlier construction of this compact set, so now I'm going to um, Say for all v not in S zero, I will take F v to be the characteristic function of C v. So C C v is constructed before. Okay, when I constructed this compact set, see I, I had to assume first I take a C S zero, eh? Okay, but now I have fixed my C S zero. After I chose this matrix coefficient, I take its support that determines C S zero, and then I do that construction. Uh, I get some C v. I take the characteristic function. Okay. Now, um, now consider this Poincaré theory, Cf of H, just averaging over the group to make it HK invariant on the left. Is, uh, so I want to show that this, uh, I mean, first it's not zero, right? But in fact, I, I will show that when you compute this, uh, this thing is not zero. Of course, then, then it will show that it is not zero, but in addition, it will have this uh, globally n-chi distinguished property. So why, why is that? So that's a computation. You put in the definition. <coughs> this is compact, so that uh, this negation is, is a harmless thing. Okay. Now, um, Now, um, okay, in this integral, when we sum over this, okay, you see, it suffices to sum over, suffices to sum over um, uh, now I remember what uh, I miss out in there, but um, I mean, there's an N here, right? So I should see something like that. 
Um, but okay, so I, I guess uh, I, I now, now I realize I, I missed out something earlier. So because okay, so for example, if if let's let's pretend n is uh, trivial. Because I say I'm keeping these two examples in mind. If n were trivial, of course, there's no integral. I'm just evaluating pf at 1. Okay? I would ha just have this sum. Okay? But uh, there will be no n. Okay? It's just f gamma. I want to show that this is not uh, 0. Right? But by uh, uh, this key lemma, right? when I make s1 and s2 sufficiently large, the intersection will be just the identity element. And so since my function is uh, non-vanishing at 1, by construction, it is not 0. Okay. Now, if uh, I have uh, uh, this, if n equals to u, let's say, okay, then um, it's, it's still OK. It's, it's just that uh, I, I would have to, uh, what I have to do is I have to choose a compact subgroup of Na that projects surjectively onto this quotient. Okay. This exists because uh, this is in the function field k, so this has arbitrarily large uh, compact subgroup. So I'll pick a compact subgroup of Na that projects subjectively onto this. Okay. Call that a Cn, let's say. So I pick some Cn, which is compact right here. Then uh, over here, I, I would have to uh, probably do this. Now this, this doesn't affect the argument so much because uh, uh, basically uh, at the places in S0 uh, and S, um, it, it is just some, uh, you know, you still have this, okay? It is just some compact subset. So you still, you have some bound M uh, which controls the, the possible sizes of pole. But at the, the other places, once you are outside of S, this Cn, yeah, so I should say in the, when you choose your S, You, you, you want to make sure that uh, uh, for all v not in S, union S0, uh, CNV is just N of o v. Okay. So you, in other words, for the places v outside of S union S0, putting this CN there doesn't, doesn't really uh, do anything. You already, it's already in C. So the reason is because here I, I need, uh, you know, so maybe I could keep it like that. But it is a group, so okay. support of F is this C, okay. And uh, by the lemma, we know this thing is in N case. So this is by the lemma. So this means that instead of writing sum over hk, I can, re I can just sum over gamma in nk. Then I can collapse the integral with the sum. Okay. And I will get just this. And uh, let me see. By construction, uh, this is... Uh, Non-zero. Okay, because of course this is a product of local integrals at a place in uh, S naught. That that's what we have a range. We pick a matrix position just that is not zero, and, and outside of there, um, our function is just characterized as a function of this C v, and this C v is chosen so that chi v is trivial on n intersect C v. Okay, so there will actually be no chi at those uh, outside of S naught. And what you are integrating is just a characteristic function of uh, CV over uh, N. Okay. So you, you just get the volume of CV intersect NV, which is not zero. Okay, so uh, what have we done? Um, just to summarize or take a break. Um, <coughs> So I have produced uh, pf 
well, it's a cuspidal function. Okay, because uh, I think I explained this last time because at, at we are you are taking matrix coefficient of a, a super cuspidal at some place. Uh, so what you get will be will have a will be a function of, with zero constant term. So it's cuspidal function, which is uh, n chi distinguished. Now, uh, such a cuspidal function will live in L2 of, uh, in fact, it's compactly supported. So you will live inside this uh, L2 space. So you can consider uh, the HA submodule generated by this vector. Okay. Now you let pi be, a, be an irreducible summon in right, so this uh, you, you look at some uh, you have this function you look at the H uh, sub module generated by uh, this function okay. then you're going to get some uh, subspace of the space of cups forms right? and and that space is a uh, semi-simple. Okay, the space of cups form is a semi-simple representation. You break into pieces, so you just take any irreducible sum. Okay, and this guy will will, will work. Okay, so this uh, this gives the pi in the theorem. Well, have we checked all the conditions? Well, uh, it, it will be the case that at places in S naught, this uh, pi v naught is just the given supercuspital because you use a matrix coefficient. Okay? Now, so the only condition that is left to check is that at the places not in S naught, I want to make sure this thing is a principal series induced on the Borel. Now, why, why is that? Well, the reason is because this function, um, because I, I take um, at the places not in S naught, this guy is uh, what well, you know is. It, what, what is this? It, it's always some open compact subgroup. Okay, it is either at almost all places. Of course, he has no choice. It has to be this hyperspecial. Uh, but at some places, for maybe S one, I mean, it, it is J, J V plus, right? And at other places, it is I V minus. Some, something like that. So, uh, at a place where it is this, your representation will be will have a vec non-zero vector fixed by this maximal compact. So you'll be unramified. At the places where you have this, you will have a non-zero vector because this PF will have a uh, yeah. this PF has non-zero projection here because this is a summon in the submodule generated by PF. So it has non-zero projection. Right, so and that projection will, at the places in S2, will have a non-zero vector fixed by an evil Hori subgroup. Okay, so then uh, I guess it is, has been known by Borel that uh, such a representation is contained in an unramified principal series induced on the Borel subgroup. What about here? Well, this is a slightly smaller subgroup. Right? It's the pro-P uh, radical of an evil Hori subgroup. Well, uh, by results of Moy and Prasad, and also Lawrence Morris. Uh, one knows that if you have a representation which has a non-zero vector fixed by this pro P uh, Iwohori, then in fact it is also induced from the Borel, but by a tamely ramified character. Okay. So in all cases, you know that outside of the place S0, your representation uh, will be uh, induced from the Borel subgroup, but uh, from at most tamely ramified character. Okay. And that, that proves the uh, theorem. So I uh, maybe take a five, ten minute break. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry that uh, the first part was quite uh, maybe a bit technical because I talked about um, the proof in some detail. Um, now I want to uh, remind you uh, of a corollary. So let me uh, state the corollary. So in this corollary, you are given only local data. There's no global anything at all. 
And then, uh, but in order to apply the previous theorem, you have to start to globalize some of the things. Okay? So you're given a F, a local field of characteristic P bigger than zero. Um, you are given, uh, so this is one thing, now you are given, um, so the similar data is in the theorem, a connected recursive group whose connected center is ZF, and uh, let's say it contains a parabolic subgroup. a unitary character on the unipotent radical and uh, but I want to assume that uh, that it lies in an open MF orbit. I'll make a comment about what this means in a moment. Um, and you are given a pi 1 to pi a supercuspital representations irreducible uh, of HF with the same, emphasize same, uh, central character under ZF. So um, simply let's say, say ZF character, omega. And let's assume that it is NF chi F distinguished. In the same sense, the uh, Okay, so you are basically given this uh, data, uh, but everything is local here. Um, but of course, um, it is slightly more restrictive, right, than in the theorem because I don't take n to be any unipotent subgroup, right? But only the unipotent radical of a Borel, oh, sorry, of a parabolic subgroup. Uh, now, okay, so this is over everything is defined over f. Then I want to say there exists global view A replaces V1 to VA such that uh, they globalize that local field F uh, and we have uh, this picture globalizing that Um, now I have to globalize the character, right? Uh, unitary character uh, such that, okay, so of course, uh, you know, maybe you think that what I should, would like to say here is that chi of vi is equal to chi f. I could not quite, uh, one could not quite say that because you see the reason is because if you just give me an arbitrary character, there's no reason why it can be globalized uh, to a global character. So for example, suppose you take n to be just the additive group GA, right? And you have some number field K, or uh, some, some global field K. So you're looking at, uh, so you're, you're saying, well, can I find an additive character of A mod K whose V component is some given guy and the answer is no, it cannot always be done. Okay. But you can, uh, so that's why I need this uh, open orbit. So to ensure that this thing and uh, this guy uh, are in same MF orbit. I'm gonna make a comment uh, in a moment. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, Kafka uh, representation pi uh, of H A uh, as in the theorem, uh, meaning it, uh, it will globalize the given supercuspital. It will be n chi globally n chi distinguished. And at places outside V1 to VA, it will be in this uh, principal series induced from minimal parabolic. Okay, so.
so, so you see that you see, this is a corollary of the theorem. That means that we are going to apply the theorem. But before you apply the theorem, you have to uh, globalize this thing, right? Because in the main theorem, almost all data which are, that you start with are global except for this uh, supercuspital. Okay? So you, you have to globalize and find these things first on this board before you can apply the theorem. Okay? And that's what uh, mainly I want to uh, discuss. Okay? But, okay, so let me make a remark about this uh, open MF orbit condition. So note that if you consider the group of algebraic group homomorphisms from N to, uh, to GA, let's call this B, so it, it's just an affine uh, K space, fine space over, uh, sorry, over, um, oh, so maybe I should just start with F first because I, by space over F. F. Now, if you fix, uh, um, yeah. So if one fixes a character, a non-trivial character, psi F, then, of course, by composition with uh, psi. You, you get a map from, uh, so you get bijection from form, uh, just from, from BF to um, just unitary characters I didn't, uh, I suppressed the F points here. How? Because if you give me some some f here, I will just do. So you get a bijection. Okay. So I think the point of this is to say that this set of unitary characters has a natural structure of an f i f space. Okay. But the identification depends on the fixing some uh, additive character, non-trivial additive character. Okay. So. And this this bijection is uh, is a uh, MF equivariant because the M normalized N right, so it acts naturally on this set. It also acts naturally on that set. So um, this explains the condition lying in an open uh, uh, MF orbit because if I regard this. So my given chi f would be an element here, right? But which I can think of as an element there. Okay, and I so I have a f minus space with m f action, and I I would require its orbit to be Zariski open. Okay. But then uh, it means that you know because this is a vector space over f of some finite dimension, so of course it has a um, analytic topology, right? Because f is a local field, and by requiring that that orbit is Zariski open, then it will also be open in the uh, analytic topology. Now, uh, yeah, so you have the same discussion over, uh, so if you have a global field, uh, you will have the same, and, and, and you fix the, uh, uh, you know, let, let's say you fix a, a character of this non-trivial character. Okay, then, uh, similarly, you are going to get a, a bijection from VK, which is home N to GA, meaning, assuming you are in a global situation, okay, so you have S1 in the same way. So you have F. So the set of this thing uh, is a finite dimensional k vector space. Okay. 
and of course here you can take the so let's say you have a place v okay so if you have a global character you you take the v component so you have this localization map and oh, and it will just correspond to the natural inclusion of this vector space to that one. All right. Hence, you see, because this map is not a uh, subjective, right? So this means that if you give me any character here, which means a vector in this KV vector space, there's no reason why it's in the image. Okay. But if it lies in an open MV orbit, right, then the MV orbit is a open set inside this vector space, and this inclusion is dense, so you can find a k value, k rational point in that open set, okay, and that will be a global character. That well, you, you will not necessarily globalize your given guy, but it lies in the same uh, MF orbit. Okay. So I think the point is to say that to explain what that open MF orbit condition is and to say that, well, once you have globalized the things above, to, to, to find this character is just this argument. All right, so now the, our point is to globalize the field, the groups, and so on. So let's uh, do it in uh, stages, globalizing local fields. Okay. Of course, it's very easy if you want to globalize a local function field, right? Because uh, we know that every local function field um, is you know, isomorphic to a Lorentz uh, series in one variable over a finite field. So of course, then you can say, let me take k naught to be this global function field. Right? This is the function field of p one. Okay, uh, so it's very easy. Okay. However, uh, actually, I need something more. Uh, I need a certain uh, the following lemma. Given finite Galois extension. E over F of, uh, uh, of, of local fields, I can find um, finite Galois extension, um, let's say K1 to K prime over K. Uh, with a place a V such that so um, so KV is F and K prime tensor K KV is is V okay. and such that the degree of the extension is the same. Okay, of course this, this, will, this will force this uh, place, so V, the place V in K is inert in K prime and the Galois group of K prime over K, well, the local Galois group will sit in there as a decomposition group, right, but it will be isomorphic because the, the degree are the same, so. Okay, so I, uh, 
So okay, anyhow, it, it was not immediately clear to me. So the, the proof is by uh, Krasner's lemma. So in other words, it's not a sophisticated proof. Uh, let's leave it as exercise. Um, uh, what is not clear to me was like if you have this and you, let's say you start with K naught with a place uh, V such that K naught of V is F, then can you then build a, uh, can you take F to be, no, not F, K to be K naught, let's say, and then uh, and then build a K prime. This is not really clear to me, but I don't need it. So I, I'm happy to, to find some K for which it works. And maybe if you use more machinery, like um, local class field theory, you, you might be able to do this globalization with a given K. Okay? But I don't, I, I, I have the flexibility to choose K. And, but I use very little, so, so just this. You will see in a moment why I, uh, why I use this uh, lemma. Okay, so now I want to globalizing the group with the parabolic subgroup. So in application, um, yeah, oh sorry, so this parabolic subgroup could be the whole group G itself, right? So meaning, I mean, the N could be trivial. Okay, so uh, this could be equal, right? Okay, so um, the two cases to keep in mind is one of them is when it is equal, so that means I can suppress it, or when it is a Borel subgroup, so that this N is the unipotent radical of Borel. Okay, anyhow, so let me uh, first Assume, uh, assume first that HF is a uh, quasi-split. Okay. Well, we know what quasi-split groups are. So quasi-split. Ah, okay. Okay. So. Um, I mean, the, the key starting point ingredient is, is that, we, that, that we take for granted is, is uh, of course, the well-known theorem of Chavalet that there is always a split group. Given any reductive group over, say, an algebraic closed field, there is a split group defined over Z whose base change to that algebraic closed field is isomorphic to your given one. Okay. So we have, we, there is a split group H S over Z um, or F bar, let's say. Right, so that's of the same type, okay? Now, uh, so you take this split group, okay? Then, then we know that the quasi-split uh, groups over F, uh, which are isomorphic <coughs> to um, HS okay, over F bar, is in bijection with uh, Galois cohomology set. taking values in outer automorphism of HS. Now, your HS is defined over Z, so this thing is also defined over Z, and in fact, it's a constant, constant group scheme. Which means that you, you take any points anywhere, it looks the same, essentially. Okay. So you have that. Now, so we have uh, our HF, right? Our HF is, 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 uh, is, is an element here. This isomorphism class is an element here. So it, it corresponds to some co-cycle, uh, some, some cohomology uh, class, which may be represented by some co-cycle. Okay. Moreover, if E over F is a finite Galois extension such that HF splits, uh, then 
um, you can take this co cycle. You see, because this Galois cohomology set is defined as the inductive limit of H1 of Galois E over F right, over all finite, uh, finite X Galois extension. So if you have any class in here, in fact, it, it leaves inside some um, H1 of some uh, finite Galois extension. So there's some one co cycle like that. which you can use to twist the Galois action on, on the speed group and to, to, to define your HF. Okay, now I'm going to use uh, the lemma, a lemma, right, this lemma about globalizing uh, local fields. Okay, you have uh, K prime over K, global, extension of global fields, such that So um, by composition with, of this isomorphism with this map, you get a one co-cycle. So you, this is, you're going to get a one co-cycle over K. Uh, okay. You, you are going to get some class in here. And this, um, so that will be a, this, this will give a, a quasi split uh, group H over K um, such that H of KB uh, is HF. And, but in the lemma, we have some place, right, that, that localized to F and E and whatnot. Okay, now uh, how about the parabolic? Well, you see, parabolic subgroups of uh, quasi split group is very easy to describe because, in fact, um, let me do it over here. Uh, you see, because everything can be uh, described by. Um, Yeah, so, so, so I guess maybe I, I say so. So if you have a split group, of course, you have the base uh, uh, root datum. So let's say you pick a Borel subgroup. Okay, then you have this, the usual base root datum, right? Which is the character group, you have the toro, I mean the simple root for T, and you have the co-character and so on. is a base root datum. Now, um, if you have a quasi-split group, so you have this cohomology class and this co-cycle, then you get a, I mean, HF, you're going to get this, uh, I mean, this, okay, so you have this HCF, right? And this HCF is, is going to give you a twisted uh, a Galois action on this base root datum. So for example, it will permute the set of simple roots. Right? That's why you look at quasi split group, you, you have this uh, diagram automorphism. Okay? Now, and, and the parabolic subgroups are determined by orbits of this Galois group on the set of simple roots. Okay? So Dao E over F orbits on this delta uh, correspond to maximal parabolics, okay? So maybe I say, uh, subset of a set whose elements are the Galois orbits. Okay, so what the parabolics are because uh, you know, the Galois group acts on the simple roots or the thinking diagram if you wish and then uh, if you take any Galois orbit that gives you maximal 
parabolic defined over f, right, and you take a bunch of uh, several Galois orbits, and if you take all the whole, then you just get the Borel subgroup. Okay. Now, so you can read off what the parabolics are just from this uh, combinatorial data with this group action. But now, when you we define this global group, right? We we everything is based on this uh, isomorphism. So the action of uh, when you have this group over K, um, it's associated Galois uh, action on this base root data is the same as the local one, okay? Under the isomorphism from the two, natural isomorphism of the two Galois group. So, so you see that the, the parabolics are just described by the same thing, by the same combinatorial data. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the parabolics of HF and the parabolic of this H that we uh, have constructed. So that's the case of a quasi split, which in fact um, suffices for for my application, which as I said, because my application was either n is trivial or it's a unipotent radical of Borel, which means that my group is a quasi split. But let's um, consider the general case. Now, a uh, general case. Oh, uh, I see. I, I forgot to say uh, one thing. Actually, in this globalization here, I forgot to say one property that I want, which is this V. Um, I would like. Globalizing this, then such that, so let me say, such that the k rank of z is equal to the f rank of zf. Okay. I will, you will see in a moment why I need this. Okay. So for example, suppose that this zf is a one dimension split torus, so it's gm. Right? It's just fit. Now, when you globalize, of course you can you can take a an isotropic one dimension torus that globalize it. But I don't want to do that. Okay, so I want to take something with the same rank. Right? So if this guy is a rank, if the f rank is two, I want the k rank of z to be two. I don't want to make it more compact. I want to maintain the same degree of uh, uh, the splitting degree or whatever you call it. Okay. I forgot to say that now. And over here, uh, do, do I have that? Well, yes, because um, again, the F rank of ZF is something you can read off from the Galois action on the co-character or the character group of the torus, or the co-character group. Right? Because the co-character of Z, so because whatever ZF is, right, Z is a, um, the subgroup of the torus. Okay? So the co-character, uh, I mean, the center of, uh, of HF, um, which is also the center of this uh, split group HS. Right? So if you look at the split group, the, I mean, the, its connected center ZS is going to be a subtorus of TS. So the co-character group is a sublattice, which is stable under the Galois action. And what is the F rank? The F rank is the, um, if you work over Q, if you tensor this, Z lattice with Q is just a dimension of a fixed space by the Galois action. Okay, but since our Galois module is the same under the isomorphism, then that doesn't change. That doesn't change the the split rank of the center. So in the quasi split case, you see that the, the main reason is just that because the structure theory of a quasi split group, every almost everything can be read off from the Galois action on the base root datum of its split form. So if you manage to globalize in such a way that this Galois module is the same, then, uh, then, then all the things will be okay. All right, now uh, let's come to the general. Uh, general case, okay, so, so given HF, okay, so now it might not be, a, it's not a quasi split form anymore, but you can let it, this thing be its uh, for this split inner form. Okay. 
I mean, you still have the split form HS, okay, as before. Okay, then, um, by what we have just done, we have found a, a few K and we have found a H prime over K, uh, you know, globalizing. Ah, so uh, I should say, okay, there's this parabolic, okay, but there will be a corresponding parabolic on the quasi sphere form. You see, because somehow the, um, if you have an inner form of a quasi split group, it has less parabolics than the quasi split form. Okay, so every parabolic or inner form is a, there is a corresponding uh, parabolic for the quasi split form. So now we have already, we have already found this. Right, globalizing. Okay, this is by the case just now. Okay, and such that the center, you know, the rank works out correctly. Okay, all right. Now, now let's see. Suppose we just forget the parabolic at the moment, and we just want to find uh, globalize this group. Okay. Um, how do we uh, um, do that? Um, okay. So, um, so, 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 so th this group is going to give. A certain class in H one of uh, F of the inner automorphism of H prime uh, F. Right. This inner automorphism is nothing but the adjoint group. Sorry, a lot of the subscripts. What we are asking, in other words, so we need to show, need to show that the, the natural map, the natural uh, localization map from H1 K of uh, H prime adjoint to H1 of F. So F is a uh, K V, right? is subjective. But if we know this, then we are good, right? Because then we can produce an inner form, uh, which, uh, which globalizes uh, HF. Because the, so HF give a, I mean, it's a class here. So if it's subjective, I find something there that maps to it. Then I'll have found an inner form of H prime over K that localized to my H prime. Okay, so, um, so this is actually a theorem that this thing is uh, subjective. So in characteristic zero, this is a theorem of Borel and Harder. This is uh, in a paper. Seventy-eight seven. Uh, of course, I mean they can work with a finite set of places, not just one. So if you have a finite set of places, you have mapped to the direct sum of H one over K V as V runs over F. It is uh, surjective. And uh, so, in, in characteristic uh, P bigger than zero, um, so basically the argument have been extended uh, by. Uh, Um, this is uh, maybe within the last 10, 15 years. Okay, so I mean the upshot is that you um, you can globalize this group um, HF to a group over the uh, 
global field. Okay, now you want to also globalize the parabolic, right? Not just the, okay, so, but for, so for us, uh, we need to consider uh, not just the inner automorphism group of H prime, uh, but the inner automorphism group of the, of the pair. If you want to use the Galois cohomology, you, you will be looking at inner automorphisms of H prime that preserve this uh, P prime. But of course, the parabolic is self-normalizing. So this thing is just P prime uh, adjoint. Uh, P prime adjoint just means the parabolic subgroup uh, that you obtain from P prime by projecting it to the adjoint group of H prime. Okay. So, so what we need is uh, we need the surge activity of H1 A to H1 F But, um, but of course, uh, it is not hard to see that this is just uh, controlled by the, by the levy. The, the, the n unipotent radical of a parabolic is a k-split, is split. So it's successive extension of GA, so there's no cohomology. Okay. Now this m prime is a deductive group. Okay, so I mean, basically, you want to uh, you want to reduce it, this result, but this result is uh, it, it works for semi semi simple groups. So you have to do a little bit or more work because these are reductive groups, right? They are parallel Levy subgroups of uh, some semi simple groups. Okay, but because it is a semi simple group, um, but you see that if we look at M prime, um, this looks bad. At the, you know, it's some reductive group. You can look at the derived group. Okay, the derived group, of course, sits inside here, and the quotient A is a split torus. Why? Uh, it's because uh, you see this is a levy in this adjoint group. Okay, there's no center. Okay, the group has no center. So when you take a levy, you, you just uh, you just acquire some split torus. Something whose h one is uh, trivial, so so now you, this is going to lead to the the following uh, diagram. Sorry, that's a derived. So it's going to go to this h one of a, but but this is a zero by uh, because it's a split torus. Okay. Similarly, uh, over F, okay, so what are we saying? We are saying that this map is surjective. These two maps, are horizontal maps, are surjective because of the zero. Um, th this is a semi-simple group. So by those theorems, this, this is subjective. So, so this forces this to be subjective. Right? If you give me an element here, I leave it to there, I leave it to there, and whatever the element is, when they map here, they will descend to the one here. So this uh, forces the subjectivity. So that, that shows that you can, uh, so that's, that's what we want to show. Okay, now, uh, and yeah, and the, the other thing is about this, uh, the F rank and the so on. Uh, you see, because this is an inner tree, so whenever you get this uh, 
co-cycle value in the adjoint group, right? So you are just twisting the Galois action of H prime by an inner automorphism. And that doesn't do anything to the center. Right? Inner automorphism commutes to the center. So, so it doesn't change uh, the Galois action on the center at all. Okay, so, so that, that finishes the uh, proof of the corollary because uh, I have, now I've globalized the field, the H and the P and the Z with the required properties. Okay, I already explained how you can globalize the character chi F and then now you're in a position to apply the theorem. Now, why is it that I don't allow any unipotent uh, subgroup? Because here I only look at unipotent radical of uh, parabolic. Well, it's because I do not know if the following is true, that if you give me any unipotent group in some group over local field, so as we explained here, we can globalize this group over some number of field. But I don't know if you can always globalize a unipotent subgroup over local field. But see, I know almost nothing about unipotent subgroups, except maybe unipotent radical of parabolics. I don't know what they look like in general. I don't know if they could be globalized. And okay, that, that's the reason. Yeah. Okay, and uh, maybe last five minutes I want to, uh, I have not, uh, there's still one other thing, right? I have to globalize this uh, central character. Did I mention that uh, uh, in the corollary? I forgot if I mentioned that. I did mention that? So I, I, okay, so the last thing is, uh, so we have this ZF, right? And we, which we have globalized to Z uh, in such a way that F rank of ZF <coughs> is equal to K rank of Z. Okay. Now uh, I just conclude with the following lemma. So, uh, Actually, before I say that, uh, let, me, let me say this first. Okay, so given uh, this data and given a character omega uh, v naught from k v naught from v uh, v naught, v of k v naught, which is this zf f, There exists an omega um, so of course I want uh, let me call this omega f um, okay then I want omega to be a uh, trivia on Distinguished phrase V naught. So this T is non empty, okay? Non empty. Okay, so what is this? Uh, sorry, this is a bad notation because it, this, this is the maximal compact, maximal bounded subgroup. So this is what this zero means. And uh, this one here means uh, it's the maximal. Rho P uh, subgroup. Okay. In other words, uh, what I'm doing is I'm given a character at uh, one place and I want to globalize it and such at all other place, I have some control on the ramification. Right? So, you know, I can take T to be a singleton set. Okay, that's not a problem. I can take T to be a singleton set. That this means that in fact, my character is unramified, so the, I mean, meaning it's trivial on a maximal compact at all places except maybe one, I mean, be, be beyond the, uh, the fixed space that you care about. But even at this place, the ramification is not so bad.
Okay, now let me make a couple of remarks. I mean, the, the, the first is, uh, why do I insist on this condition? Well, you see, if you don't have this type of condition, right, you, you cannot even globalize a local character. For example, let's take the case when this is a split uh, GM, it's just GM. Okay. But suppose you globalize, uh, instead of just taking GM, you, you, you globalize it to be an anisotropic torus. Okay. Now, when you look at GM, of course, it's just uh, some F cross, right? Um, F cross is, is basically O F cross cross uh, Z. So you see that it is basically a compact group cross a discrete group. So what are its characters? Well, the character of a compact group is a discrete set. The character of this has a, is a one dimension continuous uh, family. Right? You, you can take send an one to any element in S1. So the character of a local, uh, you know, of GM over local view, it, it has a discrete parameter and a continuous parameter. But suppose you globalize this to be the, a one-dimension anisotropic torus. Okay, then you are trying to find automorphic characters, right? Characters of ZA mod ZK. But that will be a compact group if, if it's anisotropic. Then, so the only characters it has is the discrete set. So you just from cardinality reason, you see there's no way. You can globalize a local character to a global automorphic one. And hence, uh, you need to maintain this, uh, this type of condition. Now, uh, the other comment I want to make is that in the corollary, you see I have A places that I'm trying to globalize. But so far, I've just globalized one place. But this is okay, because once I globalize one place, um, so far, okay, then I will just take an extension of K so that this place B not splits into A different ones. Okay? And then I will base change everything I find over there. Okay? That is why in the corollary, I insist that even though I have A places, the this omega, is the, the central character is the same uh, because I cannot really globalize two places in general. Because for example, suppose this is GM and now you're, you're smart, you, you decide to globalize using GM instead of an isotropic one. So that, okay, but now suppose you're given two characters, I mean meaning two places of K, so you have two characters. Okay. But now you find that you have uh, two discrete parameters, two continuous ones because you have two places. But on the global, uh, you know, if we look at GM, so you're just looking at the ideal class group, the norm one ideals is compact. The quotient is real numbers. So you see that the automorphic character is just discrete parameter plus one continuous one. So again, there's no way you can globalize two arbitrary characters. So that's why I insist it's the same one. So in fact, what I do is I globalize one place and then I just find an extension that splits totally at that place, and I base change my, all the data over there. Okay. Uh, maybe I don't talk about the proof of this because it's five o'clock, so I think I will, I will stop here for today. <laughs>